Um, let's begin, everybody. So welcome back. Happy Friday. Beautiful weather. Breaks are coming up soon. I know that this is a difficult time of the semester. It always is. But you learn a lot So through these crunch times. We're going to go over my code in a little bit. I want to tell you more about the Metropolis Hastings algorithm before we do that. So let's just get started and write this stuff down. We left off talking about proposal strategies. And if you have an infinite number of questions about different proposal strategies, that's the correct number of questions. So that's how Metropolis Hastings algorithms differ. So um, I'm just going to write down the Metropolis Hastings algorithm one more time, and we'll kind of talk about it. So Metropolis Hastings. So there's a step zero, and that's the initialization. And our goal here is to sample from some distribution. And I always write it out looking like a posterior distribution because Bayesians are always operating off of this particular distribution. But this algorithm is a general sampling algorithm. So Bayesians want to construct a posterior. If they construct a really complicated one, they won't be able to do all the integrations and figure out expectations and all of that. But if you can sample from that distribution, you can learn everything you want to know. So long as you have enough computational resources and time to spend. So MCMC isn't considered entirely quick, but it's very flexible. So that's the trade-off. You usually can have one of those things, something that's quick, um, but not flexible, very specific, or you can have something that's flexible and slow. So, and that's the way it works everywhere. Pick one. Um, the name of the game in MCMC is to make it quick, to speed it up. And so some algorithms are very quick, that you pick the right proposals. You have a really good proposal strategy. Um, so that's what happens in step one. So step one is to propose. So I'm going to propose from some distribution, G. It's a distribution on theta as well. I'm imagining that this is maybe high dimensional. It really doesn't matter what the nature of the random variables are. They could be anything, matrices, vectors, scalars, and even wonkier stuff. So like trees, for example. You can do this on like neural nets too. You can plug that thing in and try to sample it. Neural nets have so many parameters that are so correlated with each other that good luck. You know, you're not going to be able to make a really deep one. So usually you just run the optimization and you don't care about your uncertainties. You just want a quick prediction. And so that's another thing that can run fast so long as it's well tuned. And there's a little bit that I'm hiding when I say that well tuned. Um, neural networks, yeah, right. <laughs> you know, they're kind of in the ballpark. So, but neat strategies. This is different. So, our proposal can be Markovian, and that's what I'm denoting right here. I should note that G must cover pi our target. So what I mean by that is, let's say my target were here. So this is pi. And let's say I had a G that was static. It was right here, and it was truncated right there. So maybe this tail goes on, but this is stops right there. If I can't propose over here, I can't learn from that. And so what I'll do is it'll converge to the posterior of the truncation. And so you want your G to be able to move anywhere pi lives. If you make G over cover pi, no problem. Um, I will say a little bit, and I'm not going to go into any great details here, G should be heavier tailed than pi. It's not absolutely mandatory like it is in an accept reject algorithm, um, or an important sampling algorithm gets played really badly. 
if you don't have heavier tails than G, but basically G should throw stuff out there every once in a while. If Pi had real heavy tails and G barely ever got there because it has, you know, really light tails, it doesn't ever propose, it's going to be hard to learn about the tails. So G must cover Pi. So this would be a bad idea right here if that works. I think that makes sense. Um, G also has to have the property that it's not systematic. There's no funny patterns in everything. What I mean by that is it doesn't spit out the parameters in a non-random way. So like, let's say that there's three values for theta, and I always see value one, and then when I resample from it again, I always see value two. When I resample from it again, I see value three. So it has to be really um, random. I have to be able to get from anywhere to anywhere eventually. So that's kind of the G covering everything. And these are the ergodic conditions. And if I were teaching a real Markov chain class, I would be going into great details about that. So I'm not going to do that here. We might do it later in class. So, and then there's the acceptance move, your decision. And this is called the metropolis hasting decisional. So it's the minimum between one and some positive thing. So this is going to be bounded between zero and one. This is a probability. So this looks like this. Data where I propose to, give it X, compare it to where we're coming from, our last time step, give it X, and then I have this inverse ratio proposal. Chain class, that will make sense to you. 
Um, if G is well constructed, the limiting distribution exists. An example of when the limiting distribution doesn't converge to the stationary distribution is if I use a G that doesn't cover pi. And so it'll limit to something and it won't be stationary. So if I have funny patterns and cycles, then um, it might not converge as well. And if I can't get from everywhere to everywhere eventually and come back eventually as well, so basically I can move around the space. So I don't just see something once. So it's not enough to say I can get from anywhere to anywhere eventually. I also have to be able to return. That makes sense. And so if you have all of those conditions, the limiting distribution will exist and it will be stationary. So, but basically you're just thinking about some random distribution right here that doesn't have funny patterns built into it. It's like a random process. Um, this thing will eventually converge. The trouble is, is how long is eventually? So I could set something up that takes millions of years to converge. It'll never actually happen on the computer. Have so like if you were to make a proposal of the normal distribution, it would always eventually converge? Yeah, so let's imagine, let's imagine I did something like this. So I'll say theoretically yes. <laughs> but it, theories, it's nice. It's a guiding light. So imagine I had some distribution like this. Imagine this is really wide. And say my G was just static. It didn't actually move. It didn't depend on the previous time step. And I just had some proposal that looked like this, some normal distribution that was really concentrated over here. Yeah. Let's imagine this stuff is like 50 standard deviations away. So in theory, I'll eventually, if I run this forever, grab a sample that's 50 standard deviations away, and I'll start learning about that space. It will take me a long time to do that. But on a computer, that will never happen. You're never going to sample something that's like thousands of standard deviations away. The computer's going to think that's zero probability. So yes, theoretically, in practice, you might have to wait forever and even longer. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, that's the question. How do I select G? You tell me pi, I'll give you a lot of different strategies. So this is what I do for a career. I know good Gs. So there's a lot of different algorithms for different Gs. So I'm going to give you a couple easy problems. But if I had something that was very multimodal, so I had mass over here and I had another mass that was thousands of standard deviations away, the strategies I'm going to tell you aren't going to work. So, Practically, I could use some normal distribution and theoretically it would work. But if you get a problem like that, you need to learn more. And so um, parallel tempering is an algorithm that people like. I have an adaptation to that algorithm that I think is better. So it works a lot better. So I can't answer that question. Again, there's an infinite number of Gs. How do I select it? If everything is kind of condensed like this and well connected, these troughs have kind of a lot of mass in them and I can kind of move around the space, then I can give you some strategies for selecting. We'll talk about that in a second. I'm just drawing pictures on the board, but it was something high dimensional. So, like if the space looked something like this, so let's say I was in a bivariate space, theta one, theta two. So imagine those are my only parameters, that's my ID. And let's say the target looks something like this. It'd be easy to pick a G. So, no problem, everything's well connected. If, however, it did something like this, So the posterior looks something like this distribution. So these are the contours I'm kind of drawing. So the mass is in this ribbon, and they're highly correlated with each other in different directions, and the structure changes. This happens in um, hidden Markov models, for example, if you're familiar with those. The variances are tangled together. And so this might represent variances in a hierarchical model. 
that is one variance gets big, the other one wants to go small. So there's only so much variation in the system. So this is called like a boomerang distribution. And the strategies I'm going to design for you won't handle this well. So you would use something like multi-tribe metropolis or an ensemble method that we're not going to talk about it. So, um, you know, there's a lot of things in high use space that you can't really see. So I know you want to know everything It's a cool algorithm, but you'll need a whole class in years of experience to know which G's to pick it on. Okay, so like point processes are hard things to work through because you can't even write down the um, integrating factor for those models, and it depends on the parameter space. It's a normalizing constant with respect to the sampling distribution, but not with respect to the likelihood. All those sort of things, you need more complex strategies. So if you ever get totally stuck on something and you're like, this problem is wild and it's not working for me and the strategies I gave you, send me an email and we'll chit chat for it and I'll point to a chapter or a book or something like that. So I'm not going to be able to do this in all its glory. Yes? So I've seen some like trace plots and stuff and a lot of times they'll get flat lines. Yes. So it would indicate that you have chosen to stay where you are, right? Yes. Um, but then once you get into the like the V of the distribution, you've gone through burn and it's it goes back and forth. So I'm wondering, once you get to that, once you converge, do you always choose your updated like your proposal, or do you still sometimes choose to not update? Does that make sense? I don't know what you mean. So once you converge, like once you get after burn period, yes. do you ever choose theta t minus 1, or do you always choose theta star? Do you always choose what you propose? No, I always chose theta t minus 1, it would converge to a number. Yeah. I want it to converge to a distribution. So let's just clarify this. In a lot of your math classes, you want to converge to a number. This is converging to a distribution. So we don't want that. Yeah. So remember what a statistician wants is they want to quantify their uncertainty, so they want that distribution. So we write down some model for pi right here, likelihood times prior. So you model your data, come up with a good likelihood, you pick priors for judicious reasons. This algorithm is just a support to try to learn what that looks like. So it's not supposed to converge to anything other than that. So if you knew what this looked like and you could do all your integrals, you wouldn't touch this algorithm. So you never pick G in such a way that it changes the distribution. And the way you just decided that I always pick theta t minus 1, you know, i.e. you've got some number in the mass of the distribution, that's not good enough. We want variances. So I think the most important thing in statistics is covariance. So that's what I want to understand is the relationship how they're related to each other. Not just knowing that I know what the mean is, or something like that, or some number that that's the distribution. Does that make sense? Yeah. So again, our whole goal is to just learn what this looks like. So I can write it down. I could say to a scientist, they walk in, they give me all this data, I construct a hierarchical model, I write down some crazy likelihood function, I say, here are my priors, and I say, there's your solution. So that's it. It's not useful. Human can't process what all that means. So we need to be able to compute different um, things about that distribution that are informed in the process. So we have to understand this whole long distribution. That's what we want to do. Okay, so let's just talk about some proposal strategies. So proposal strategies. If you kind of knew pi lived in some area, you knew where it lived, kind of had some modes in there and kind of have some bumps and you knew where they were, you might be able to come up with a IID proposal function, G, that just kind of covers everything. So G theta, given theta t minus one, could be equal to something like a, um, let's just say G theta 
right here. It's not marked OVN. It's just some static distribution. And this would work well if I had some distribution that maybe looked like this. So pi looks maybe like this. Let's at least make it look a little bit weird. And so if I ended up picking a G that did something like this, that would be good. It covers everything. You know, it doesn't have all the inflections in here. And so running this G, using this G, it covers everything. It's got the mass in about the same location. By running this, this sampler right here, it's going to take your G samples and it's going to correct them up in a particular way um, that ends up producing samples from pop. So that's an independent sampler. I'm not going to say I've never used this, but it's rare. So that I have something this simple. This is the most common proposal strategy. The next one I'm going to show you. So this is called the independent proposal. Very rarely use this. Uh, maybe once or twice, twice in my career. Okay. So here's probably the most common strategy that people use, and that's the um, random walk. So what this might look like is.
Because if I think about my backwards transition, moving from theta star to theta t minus 1, it's just flipping the roles of these. And that's the same function. So it could be squared. But it doesn't make any difference. So this density right here is symmetric. Let me write that down. Symmetric. And so when this thing right here is 1, i.e. the distribution is symmetric, proposal is symmetric. This is called the Metropolis algorithm. So not the Metropolis Hastings algorithm. So in the early 50s, Metropolis proposed this algorithm. He had the requirement that you use a symmetric proposal, and he said the decision rule was just the ratio of your targets. And most people will use this, and they'll still call it Metropolis Hastings. And some people I use Metropolis Hastings algorithms where everything is not symmetric, and they'll nickname it Metropolis. So for me, everything's Metropolis Hastings. It's still Metropolis Hastings. Um, but there's a special constraint on it. So these can be pretty useful proposals. In higher dimension, it's going to look like this. So in very high P, i.e. beta is equal to a lot of values in here. Say theta 2, theta 3, theta 4, up to theta 1052. So 1052 parameters I need to update. So let's imagine our strategy looks like this it's a high dimensional normal distribution. I'll put my star there. Two pi per root two pi raised to the 1052. You don't actually need this number because it cancels out of the ratio. We'll write it down anyway. I've got some covariance matrix right here. Sigma to the one half. So this is going to be a 1052 times 1052. So big matrix. E to the minus. 1 half beta star minus beta t minus 1 sigma inverse beta star minus beta t minus 1. So this is a multivariate Gaussian. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to be sitting somewhere and I'm going to propose this new vector. Vector. Shouldn't one of those be transposed? Yes. This one is. So this is a vector that looks like this and this is a vector that looks like that. Thank you. So this has to be a scalar right there. So good job. So if it wasn't, the matrix algebra wouldn't make any sense. And on a test, I usually get really frustrated when you guys do it. So forgive me for doing it. I didn't mean it. So hopefully if you do it, you don't mean it either. Okay, so we're not dividing by a matrix, I just want to point out. When you divide by a matrix, it really upsets me too. There's no such thing as that. This is the determinant of this thing, so that's a scalar value. Um, we don't have division by matrices, we've got to see that it pops up right there. Um, this could either be a really good strategy or a really bad strategy, depending on how you've tuned sigma. And so a lot of times when you're marching through this, you're trying to figure out what these covariances are between everything. And if you can start to learn it, then maybe you can update your proposal. So oftentimes what I'll do in a strategy like this is I'll run my metropolis sampler, maybe with sigma being the identity, multiplied by some tuning parameter. And it'll get stuck a lot. 
So it won't accept the move because I'll always be proposing it to the wrong location. But if I run it all night, I can come back and I can look at the covariance of my samples eventually. And then I can get some idea of, oh, okay, I can kind of see what this correlation structure is in the target. And then I can take maybe my empirical samples that I've got out of everything, and I can look at the covariance of that, calculate it, and re-update my proposal. So a lot of times this is an iterative procedure. You run for a while, you see how well you're doing, you see where the target maybe lives, and then you adapt everything. There are automated schemes for doing that. And the idea is, is that if the changes in my proposal eventually decay and you stop changing, eventually it will converge. But if your proposal strategy is changing all the way through the algorithm, there's no basis for this algorithm to converge. So my recommendation is run it, look at everything, rerun it again. And whatever you do, if you want to automate that, that's fine. Just make sure the automation stops eventually. Okay. I think the theory says that the changes can be decaying and there's some rate of decay, but I would say just stop changing it and plug in what you think is good and rerun it from the game. One thing is a theoretical thing, one thing is a practical thing. The practical thing mimics the theoretical thing, and it's actually theoretically better, I think. I think. So usually you adapt your proposals. Here's the really big trouble with this, right here is doing this. Imagine. I throw um, 1,051 of these parameters. They get thrown into the massy part of the distribution. And one of the samples is just way out there. And it's not close. You're going to reject the whole block. You'll reject everything. So if you try to update everything together, there's a good chance you will fail. And it won't work. And that's where Gibbs merges with Metropolis AC. So what you can actually do is you can break things into blocks so you're not updating everything together, you're updating things in blocks. Usually you want to update things in blocks where the parameters are associated with each other. And so you can kind of see like a distribution that looks like this. And you can try to imagine this in higher dimensional space, I just can't draw it, where everything is highly correlated. You wouldn't want to update these parameters separately because they have something to do with each other. You would want to learn what maybe this correlation structure looks like and then build that into your proposal. And so if parameters are highly related to each other, you want to update those together. Uh, so you'd want to learn what this looks like and you can run kind of your clunky sampler to try to learn it. Um, if your distribution looks like this, and it changes, so it's a different type of boomerang distribution, nothing I'm going to tell you is going to work very well today. You need an ensemble method. But if the covariance structure changed on different sides of things, maybe you could learn that, and maybe you could build it and use a mixture proposal or something like that. We're not going to talk about it. So, but if things are related to each other, you want to update them together. Let me write that down. And then what you do is you move to a Gibbs strategy with maybe Metropolis built in. If you had a diagonal matrix, it's just diagonal, you would have an ellipse 
that's axis parallel. If you have non-diagonal terms, di diagonal terms that are non-zeros, it's rotating angles. And the parameters have some minimum. No problem. Okay, it's with metropolis. So let's just say, say you can write down. Full conditionals, theta one, or maybe something like this. Maybe um, let's, let's give an example first. So imagine um, maybe theta one and theta two are very correlated. Something like that. You'd want to update these together. And then say you had two other parameters. So imagine this is a four dimensional example. So for the Say theta three and theta four were not very related. To each other, or theta one and theta two. So you might be thinking like that triangular distribution that I have. I'd say those parameters, while they're related to each other, phi and mu in that example, that's what's giving the triangular shape. They're not super related to each other. You know, so it's not inducing some correlation. So the correlation between those parameters is zero. So if you try to figure out the correlation, they're zero. So there's an association. The so correlation is a measure of linear association, a special type. Things in a circle or something that are super related to each other, but their correlation is zero. So correlation isn't the only thing going. What you can do is you can hybridize Metropolis and Gibbs. writing down the initialization steps, you'll need to initialize them. You might do this. You might be able to sample from the full conditionals. So possibly you could write down the Gibbs sampler and you could do this. Theta 1, theta 2, given x and everything else. Theta 3, t minus 1. Theta 4, t minus 1. So I'm going to get theta 1, theta 2 out of this. I'm going to call these t's. So I'm going to get joint samples from its full conditional. Theta 3, I'm going to get from its full conditional. So this would be the Gibbs strategy. I condition on everything else. Theta 1, theta 2, theta 4. This, these two are going to be updated at its most current value. I've already updated them. And this one I'm still waiting to update. So I condition on my most recent values. Theta 4 I get from its full additional. Additional on the data, additional on everything else. All those parameters have been updated, so I'll put in their most recent values. So this would be your Gibbs strategy right here. And the idea in Gibbs is that you know how to sample from everything. If you didn't know how to sample from one of these distributions, you could include a metropolis hasting step. So say you don't know how to sample
from this distribution, give it x, beta 3, beta 4. And you don't know how to sample from this full conditional. Beta 1, beta 2, beta 3. So maybe you know how to sample from this. Maybe this is a gamma. Maybe this is a normal gamma distribution, like the, the mean variance distribution that we've been studying with the mean precision. Maybe this is some other distribution. You just don't know what it is. You don't have a sampler. What you can do is you can vary a metropolis easing step. So what I mean is you propose. You have to come up with a proposal, and then you accept using our decision rule. And then maybe you do this over here. So you need definitely a different proposal down here because it lives in a different space. So you'd have to come up with a proposal there. Here's a fact. This will kind of clue you in to the reason why this is true. So if our proposal was the full conditional, You'd never, ever do this. So imagine I do know how to sample from this right here, but I said, eh, I just want to see what happens. I'm going to vary a metropolis hasting step in here, and I'm going to use the target as the proposal. If you work out the metropolis hastings decision rule, the metropolis hastings probability alpha it will be equal to 1. So if you use the full conditional as your proposal, and you happen to try to make a metropolis decision, your probability would always be 1. So you always accept. And so Gibbs doesn't have a probability attached to it. There's not that part of the algorithm. But if you so wanted to invoke metropolis hastings, you would work out that the probability is always 1. So you always accept those moves. You might think that that's appealing, always accepting, but sometimes sticking around is a good idea. So you can be more ambitious in the way that you move. And so it depends. So if all of a sudden there's a lot of autocorrelation between parameters or something like that, it's usually better to update them as a block and to incur the sticks where you stick around. You'll have to experience this for yourself. So let me show you my code. And then I'll hand you back your homeworks. We'll come back next time and we'll pick up with this code. So this won't be the last time. I'll throw it online so you can play around with it. We'll spend a lot of time talking about this on one day. But just real quick. So my code. It's going to output all of my samples that I'm calling mu and phi, so it's going to give you those vectors back. And it takes in the data. And the only place I use the truth is um, when I plot everything for you. I did kind of use it in my initializations, but not in any sophisticated way. So you shouldn't use it. If you knew the truth, you don't need to run any output. You don't need to do statistics. So, what I usually do, all the samples that I'm going to carry with me, I usually pad them with zeros first, so I open up that clock of space, so that I'm not always um, filling a new space. MATLAB will do that for you. It'll open up space, it'll construct a pointer. It doesn't actually construct a pointer, it's a reference. So, and it opens up a block, and it makes something like a linked list. If you know what that is, great. If you don't, that's fine. Um, this will speed everything up that it already knows how much memory to allocate. Okay, 
So I take that back. That lab doesn't make a loop list. That would be the right way to do it. This is a vectorized language. So what it does is it copies your vector, opens up a new vector with one more spot, copies everything in, then adds that new element in it, and throws everything away. So it's even worse. Really slow way of doing everything. So open up space, initialize everything. I do some plotting right here. Hopefully this is um, commented enough so that you can see everything. We'll come in and play around with this. But basically all the guts of this code are in these two little blocks right here. This first block updates mu in a gets fashion. And I do know how to sample it from that full conditional, but I'm just doing this in a metropolis fashion with a proposal just so that you can see the combination of these things. So what I've asked you to do on your homework is sample directly from the full conditional. And it converges really quickly. So it's good to see an algorithm taking its time to converge. So I've broken this into Metropolis Hastings steps. You didn't need to do that, but I'm pretending I just don't know how to sample from those distributions. So my proposal right here is I'm going to take some normal, symmetric, and I'm going to jitter it a little bit. And I have some tuning right here. And it's pretty arbitrary. I just stuck these numbers in so I can change them and you can see what they do. I center it where I'm at last time. I'll point out that I do everything on the logarithmic, logarithmic scale. And if I didn't do that, um, there would be a, a real problem here. So everything's on a log scale. And I'll walk you through these steps a little bit later, but effectively this is all the same thing that I wrote down for you, but on a logarithmic scale. So what I don't mean is I don't take the logarithm of, here I have the likelihood times the prior, and the prior is one in this case. I could take this big product of everything, form the likelihood, and then take the logarithm at the end of the day, and it won't work. So if I start very far away, basically, my Pose values will be very far away from my data. This will be a very big number. Right here, when I square it, it'll be an even bigger number. And when I go to exponentiate everything, EXP, it's going to make that zero. And everything will work. If it's not working, I'll be dividing by zeros. So there'll be a big problem there. So I did run this, make this at least right so that you could see it work. We'll come back next time and see. Uh, how it works when I uncomment this, and I do it not on a log scale. Basically, the code will blow up. Um, the ratio becomes a difference on the logarithm scale, and so you're operating on a different scale right there. And so I plug that ratio in right here. This is my decision right here. I'm flipping a coin. Usually, I check to see if a uniform is less than the probability. So what's the probability that a uniform is less than something like 0.7? Uniform 0, 0.1 is 0.7. So this is the inverse CDF sampler for Bernoulli, coin flip. But I have to take a logarithm of that uniform. We'll talk about that next time, too. And then I just do my updates. There's something very similar right here. So keep in mind, for precision, that's always a positive parameter. And so I need like some sort of truncated thing. I can't just use a normal that throws in a negative. If I throw a negative into there, that's not even a distribution anymore. So you're going to try to sample from something that's not a distribution. It's actually going to flip the tails up when you do that. That's a real problem. Um, so I'll point out this isn't a symmetric proposal. And there's a slight problem with my code. And I'm going to send you a link to an article that talks about this problem. And so what I want you to do is think about maybe fixing this code. You can't actually tell. And that's what the article talks about. Um, I'll come back next time and I'll fix this for you and you'll think about it, but I just want to provoke you with this. It actually does work in a way that it's, it's almost undetectable. And I'll send you an article that discusses that. Um, but I need some sort of positive proposed value right here. So I have this truncated proposal. I'm taking normals, but anytime I see something negative, I throw it away. So I'm actually using an accept, reject sampler and just throwing away samples that are valid samples. And then I make my decision as well. I do it all on a log scale as well. And if I didn't do it on a log scale, even this example wouldn't work very well. And then everything else is just plotting. So I plot everything for you. I think I'm going to just close it down right there. We'll come back. We'll play around with the tuning parameters. We'll discuss you know, the 
non-symmetry of that truncated proposal and what you have to do to fix everything up. And then hopefully you'll be on the, the club of MCMCers and you'll get started with the first MCMC algorithms and then you'll be taking some of the Let me hand you back your homework. Great.